Uh, but first, uh, just kind of want to give a kind of a little brief lecture on what virtual reality is. So I'm going to start with this definition, uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a you know four lines of a bunch of words, but there's really four components to that that I'll break it down. So I won't read the entire definition for you, but the first component then is that it's a medium, right? So that's the title of my talk. Uh, and it, importantly, it's an interactive medium, right? So it's, an, it's a medium where you're not just kind of accepting things in a linear fashion. You can do, get to do things, you get to push back, you get to uh, uh, explore uh, different avenues while you're, while you're inside the virtual world. <clears throat> uh, oops, uh, do clip. Uh, next is this sense the participant's position and actions. We call that, in short, we'll just call that tracking the user. So if you watch the, the uh, little picture in the lower right here, you'll see that uh, my colleague here takes two different viewpoints. When he's looking here at these uh, shapes, you'll see what looks like a triangle, a uh, trapezoid, and a square. But as he moves around, the relationship, the actual relationship between those objects is revealed, right? So he goes, so this, this uh, alternate back and forth, and you can see it's actually a pyramid behind a cube. So it's two three-dimensional objects, which if you're just kind of holding still and you don't get to move around, you don't see what happens. Uh, and speaking of seeing what happens, the next step in our definition then is replacing or augmenting uh, one or more senses. So we have to display to the user. And here we'll use the word display, not just for visual display, but for any, any sensory modality. Uh, typically visual, but uh, we won't limit it to that. Uh, and then finally, uh, with the goal to make, to put the user kind of into the simulation, make them feel like they're in the simulation, and we'll use the word immerse. We want to immerse the user. <clears throat> so that's our definition of virtual reality. Uh, you'll see sometimes other definitions for that in the, before the VR boom of the last few years, people would often use conflate it with virtual world, which I'll, I'll briefly talk about the difference in a moment. Uh, but you'll see that I have five key elements of what makes up a virtual reality experience. Uh, so the, the people, both the people who are experiencing it and the people who made the experience, we're gonna count those as two of the important elements. The virtual world, which I just mentioned, which is the content, what's inside the VR experience. Physical immersion, which in a moment we'll talk a little bit more about, as opposed to mental immersion. We want you to actually be in that space. And then again, we talked about it being an interactive medium. So interactivity is important. But the thing I want to focus on for a few slides is the notion of physical immersion. Physical immersion is, is kind of the most important one, at least for when you're talking about VR as a, as a particular medium. Uh, because it shows relationships between objects, which these uh, objects in the lower right have been showing. All right. So, uh, so again, that's what VR is, makes VR unique, is this notion of immersion. I said before, though, that uh, we can talk about physical versus mental immersion. So I want to explore that a little bit. I should stand by my laptop. Uh, and that is that in physical immersion, it's where the body senses uh, the virtual world as though it were real or the physical world. Uh, whereas mental immersion, which we can get through other media, is basically the mind engaging with the world as though something were happening, right? If someone in our virtual world dies, there we go. So mental immersion engages the world as though we're real. Uh, and so here, just to revisit, and I'll go through these, oops, so quickly revisit, that was faster than I thought. So that was this notion of, right, we can see the hidden relationships, that's physical immersion, we just talked about that. So I wanna talk a little bit about mental immersion, uh, and that again is engaging the world, but uh, to be mentally immersed does not require VR, right? So I've got here a novel, um, a, a motion picture and an old style computer game. And all those things have virtual worlds. They all let you become mentally immersed. Uh, <clears throat> I was about to say before that, you know, you can become um, attached to characters in these worlds, right? There's even an old interactive computer game where you, there's this robot that follows you around. And when the robot gives up his life for you, the player, you know, that can be an emotional experience because uh, even though that, uh, uh, you know, it's just a, uh, uh, code in a, in a computer, but again, your mind is engaged with that virtual world, so you've become mentally immersed. Uh, perspective, a little bit different than uh, immersion, but very, much, very highly correlated. So physical perspective is then I'm seeing something from the perspective, the direction of my eyes, right? 
Uh, it's not necessarily how in drawing we talk about first uh, or a single point, double point, triple point perspective. It's more the fact that you're looking at it from someone's specific vantage point. And mental perspective is sort of putting yourself, say, in someone's shoes, right? So here is physical position, position for physical perspective. And for mental perspective, it's having, putting yourself in someone's circumstances or their emotional state, right? And this then allows mental immersion. And so uh, both of these things are kind of the tools we use to get to this immersive state, both physically and mentally. All right. <clears throat> so again, physical perspective, we want uh, perspective rendering. Uh, we want to render from the eye location, leads us to physical immersion. Mental perspective, we want to put ourselves in someone else's circumstances. And so the pictures here represent uh, a virtual reality artwork uh, executed by a photographer who had suffered a car accident. <clears throat> and after her car accident, she had had some brain injuries. Uh, her, her skeletal muscular system healed itself, right? She also had some broken legs and things. And so once that had healed and she was able to walk, people thought, well, she's healed, right? But her, she still had some uh, residual effects uh, to, from her brain injury. And so she would see the world in different ways. So the one on the left shows that sometimes she would kind of see this cloudy world. So uh, we're looking at some of her uh, photographic artwork, but in the case of the left, it's clouded over. You can't see very much of it. And in the case of the right, when she would walk, sometimes the world would kind of swim on her. And so you can see uh, this photograph kind of swims as you walk around. And so this is a virtual reality experience meant to mentally immerse you into this person's uh, circumstance. All right, <clears throat> and then here we get to this point where it's kind of uh, things overlap. So uh, we also want to talk then, we were talking about physical, but now we're talking about physiological response, which is where your mind is engaged in the experience to the point where your heart rate is affected, your skin response is affect, reflect, uh, affected, your respiration is affected, right? So now the physical immersion causes mental immersion and to the degree where you actually feel this, uh, uh, the emotions of what's going on. And so again, it's kind of like a combination of the two uh, experiences. All right, and that's been used to great effect in the, some of the earliest successes in the use of virtual reality. So back in the mid 90s, a company was formed specifically to treat people of their phobias by putting them into virtual reality experience, copies of the various experiences, say spiders or heights or airplanes. Uh, and even though, especially back at the time, the worlds were fairly cartoonish, uh, and in this case, I say it's enhanced by passive haptics, so you'll see the, the patient here, or the subject, uh, is touching this sort of toy spider. And the toy spider has a little device on the bottom of it that tells the computer where it's at. So when the, when the researcher here moves the spider around, or the clinician, uh, and the patient, in this case, she reaches out and touches it. Wherever that spider moves, that's where she's going to see it. And so it becomes, the two are correlated and makes the world a lot more effective uh, <laughs> mentally. So that's what we call passive haptics. Anyway, that's just kind of augmentation. Yes? Why is it passive? It's just kind of right. So because the toy here doesn't do anything. Okay. All we know about the toy is where it's at, right? Okay. Uh, so it's not like it's an actual, has little mechanical legs or is a real spider in any regard. So they display it as passive. Right. The, the initial version was just a bunch of pipe cleaners. They just had some pipe cleaners that they would track around and you would feel these fuzzy, fuzzy things and felt like a big spider legs. Uh, and people have used this, so I think I have a slide later on, but I'll mention it now. There's a, a, a program, an experience called Richie's Plank, and that's based on some experiences, which I'll show in a couple of slides. So getting a little bit ahead of myself, but to address your question. You just put a board out on the, in the room, you tell the computer where that board is, they put on head-mount display, and we'll have this here later this semester, uh, and you step on this board, and then it puts you like you're floating in space or you're walking off the edge of a cliff on a plank. And so you walk out here, your toes feel the edge of the board. The board isn't doing anything, right? It's just sitting there, but, uh, uh, Right, it could be anything. And so we call it passive haptics because the board doesn't do anything. It just is in the right place at the right time, right? And so our brain puts that together. Oh, as a matter of fact, here's a picture of right here. So we weren't that far ahead of ourselves. So here's Richie's plank. Uh, here's some experiments conducted at the University of North Carolina, uh, which actually they were emulating some experiments at the University of College London, where they actually put wood all the way around the room, and the person would then see this ledge around what they felt was 
looking down into a room and they would see their feet here on the right and they could look down and there was about a 15 foot drop. And so this is where they did a lot of experiments measuring heart rate, skin response and, and uh, uh, respiration and discovered that people, you know, the lip, you know, the wood there is only a half inch off the ground, but it really affects you because you don't know that. You, you know, I mean, you might even know it's going in, but your brain still says it's there. It's like, like you see it. And so again, this is uh, some ex an experience we'll try later on in the semester, one of our hands-on days. Uh, and again, uh, so this is going back to this uh, phobia treatment, one of the early successes of virtual reality, and it's still being used quite a bit today. So a company packaged up virtual reality head mount displays of the old 90s style, and they were very successful. People were act successfully treated uh, both the phobias, and they also used it for uh, PTSD treatment for uh, veterans. Back then, it was in the for Vietnam veterans. Today, they're doing it for uh, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, uh, and so they have these more realistic experiences. They kind of match the visuals a little bit. You can see it's still game cartoony, but even this is a picture. The one in the upper right is a picture from the 90s, and that was enough. If you're afraid of flying and you're sitting in these cartoony worlds and you feel the rumble of the jets start going, uh, that was enough to uh, get you mentally engaged. All right, so, so that's kind of a touching on mental engagement. The next step of that conversation is this notion of presence uh, and embodiment. Uh, and so in this chart here in the middle, we have this notion of presence, which uh, we also call being there. It's like being in the space. And uh, on the left side of the chart, we have the things that kind of contribute to help make you feel like you're in that space, right? So I've broken it down into technical factors, you know, the type of displays, the resolution, contextual factors, which is what you're doing in the world. You have, you feel like you know what you're doing in the world. And then psychological factors, are you willing or to sense, suspend your disbelief? You know, are you in a good mood? Those kind of things. So those all lead uh, into whether you feel like you're in the space. And then on the right side, coming out of presence are the effects. And you'll notice there's some lines that skip that, right? So sometimes if you're just doing a task, it's like, as soon as you see the yellow ball, you know, swing at it, uh, you don't have to feel like you're there to, to do that. So you can get some direct stimulus response. Anyway, um, I'm not going to go into depth in this. Uh, so, but the, the slides there uh, in the recording and, and the slides will be posted by the way as well. So. You can take a look at that. But we have the physiological response bubble here in the, the second one down on the right, which has the things we've been talking about. All right, so that's kind of what virtual reality is. So I wanna talk about it as, as being a medium. And uh, before we actually get to that, talk about VR in the media, right? So on the left column is a bunch of novels that, or short stories in some cases, uh, written about virtual reality, starting with, I think, the first story that we kind of looks like it's talking about something that's akin to virtual reality is Pygmalion Spectacles, written in 1935, which is where the quote at the bottom comes from, which, if you read the story, it's just, uh, you know, it's a short story, but basically, it says it right there, fools, you know, I bring it here to sell it to Westman, i.e. Kodak, uh, the camera people, and what do they say? It isn't clear. Only one person can use it at a time. It's too expensive, right? All these things were said about VR just three years ago. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't, you know, it didn't happen until kind of the people got on through a Kickstarter effort to make it happen, uh, to make it happen in a big way. So, so VR as a notion has been around for a long time. Uh, in the movies, uh, it started showing up in the 90s, maybe before that, but a lot of them very specific to virtual reality. And then of course the most recent one, Ready Player One, which came out last year. Uh, but that's VR in the media. So what does it mean to be a medium then? So to be the medium is to be between two ends, right? Between two extremes. And so in this case, what we're really talking about is communication media, some a medium that's between two people or two groups of people or the same person uh, uh, from one moment in time to another moment in time. Uh, and so it's the process that we take ideas, we manifest them into something and then we share them, right? So starting with, painting on cave walls, perhaps, maybe before that. Um, so here's a very simple model, right? So we have a person on the left, the communicant. They have something in their mind that they want to share. They create a virtual world of some way. There's some medium that we, we use as a bridge to get across. Uh, and then the person on the other side experiences that virtual world and turns it into their own mental model. 
Um, and if this font is a little off down here, but it says the content conveyed by a medium is a virtual world. So I mentioned virtual world earlier. So any medium has a virtual world. It's basically that information that you want to get from one person to the other, whether it be through a novel, TV show, movie, uh, song, what have you, right? Uh, and so here, this uh, Magritte painting kind of shows this notion of idea versus reality, uh, where the virtual world, here he's talking, he says, sine palm pipe, right, which is, means this is not a pipe. It looks like a pipe, but it's not a pipe, right, because it's a painting of a pipe, or in this case, it's a digital projection of a painting of a pipe. Um, so there's this notion of that pipe is a representation of the virtual world, right, but it is not what it, it is not the actual thing, right? So the notion of idea versus reality. Here's just a list, I'm not gonna read these, but you know, lots of different media on the left, an example of that medium on the right. So for virtual reality, I have Dactyl Nightmare, which was one of the first commercial uh, virtual reality experiences. That was a game that went to arcades back in the uh, like 92, 93 era. Uh, but you can have songs, puppetry, things like that as different media. All right, here's taking that same notion of media. We've kind of blown out different examples. So it's the same as that first slide, which we bridged across. But now we know, we can see that we have different human communication media, say painting, novels, music, uh, at the bottom, virtual reality. And then under the line, there's different ways we can do it, right? So you can paint, uh, which is a visual image. You can write words, which becomes a novel. So it's, it's kind of the physical representation of that medium. The physical representation of virtual reality is kind of computer programs along with the hardware, the sensory images. Uh, and then you'll notice the last two have like computer games and virtual reality and they have this feedback loop, right? So they're interactive. Uh, so that makes them uh, slightly different than maybe than some of the other ones. All right, and so here's some examples, right? There's different ways then to physically create different media. So painting, we might do oil on canvas, some pigment on a wall, some bits in a computer memory, right? So this, all these, there are different ways to paint, but it, we consider them all paintings. Uh, the written word has a bound novel. You have to carve a poem on a monument, things like that. And virtual reality, we have different ways of doing that as well. We have head-mounted displays uh, where you might do a building walkthrough or you might have a cave, which I'll explain what a cave is in a moment, but say a bigger installation style virtual reality uh, where you might do some, some training, some military training or something, firefighting. <clears throat> All right, so again, back to this notion of medium. So the medium, I guess one thing we could say about it is that it's basically the way you interface to the virtual world, right? It's also the way the creator interfaces to the virtual world. It's the way they uh, manifest it. Uh, and so uh, we call this then basically the user interface, right? So the user interface lets us access a particular medium. Some people, not so much today, but in the past, people talked about virtual reality being the ultimate interface where you didn't have to know how to do anything in virtual reality because everything was perfectly like nature, right? You would just go and interact exactly like you would in the real world. The problem is that kind of restricts what you might want to do with virtual reality. You might want to drive around. You might want to fly. You might want to shrink yourself down. So to make everything exactly like it is in the real world uh, kind of sells VR short a little bit. Uh, so we, we want to keep those possibilities open. Uh, and again, uh, we have different media. We might have some virtual reality experiences that are created based on other media, uh, right? So like there's a game portal, we might have a portal version, a, part, a VR version of portal, which is normally a desktop computer game. Uh, or we might have take some novel and convert that into a virtual reality experiences, experience. Right, so, and of course, if you're going from a non-interactive to an interactive space, it means you're gonna have to flesh out the world a little bit more or can somehow constrain your, your uh, participants. All right, and one of the things that uh, several media do this, but virtual reality certainly is an example of this, it calls into question who's the author of the experience, right? So uh, for novels, we kind of, whoever wrote the words down, that's the author, right? But uh, at the same time, while you're reading it, there's an experience happening that might be different from other people's experience. So you're actually part of that. And that's to a larger degree true for virtual reality, right? So they can, in virtual reality, you can go different places, you can notice different things, uh, you can, you're more likely, I think, than, than some uh, media to see something that wasn't there, maybe. Uh, and so 
uh, for most of my talks and my written stuff, I use the word creator usually for the people who are responsible for putting down the words, putting down the code, uh, and, and or composer then for the person who kind of brings it to life. Right, so if you think of a song, uh, well, the composer is the same as creator, I guess, so that analogy breaks there. All right, so now we know a little bit what virtual reality is, how it fits into the world of other media, so I want to talk about the technologies related. Yes, go ahead. Right, so the question is that if in a VR experience, uh, the creator is still has to come up with all the storylines, the different possibilities that happen in a virtual reality experience. Uh, so yes, it's true. And so uh, in, in some cases, right, so some VR experiences are more intended to be narrative experiences, right? Uh, and in some cases, the narrative may be linear, uh, but it waits until you do something, you notice something, right? So there's some VR stories that, uh, nothing's going to happen differently in the story except how long it takes before certain action happen, right? So if you're in the space and something falls over, the story stops until you look and notice that that thing fell over, right? Uh, so in some respects, then depending on how patient the participant is, right, they're looking off somewhere else and they're just kind of engaged in the world over here and never, and it takes them a long time before they realize, oh, there's something happened over here. And so the story kind of just uh, uh, pauses for a while. That, that's going to change their experience, right? Uh, but for those other VR experiences where it's more of an open, say, uh, playground space, right, where you can just do anything. And so you might just program the physics of the world to behave, right? So if you go over and push over uh, a block or a stack of blocks, then they fall down. But that's not part of the story necessarily. It may not, there may not be really a story for the world. It's just kind of a place to uh, hang out and, and experiment with things. Or, uh, in some cases, you're told to do something specific by the people who put you into that space because they're training you to say, one of the applications uh, I've worked on in the past is find uh, um, uh, nuclear uh, dirty bombs, right? So you have to find where's the radiation coming from. And so you kind of walk around and you have to take your uh, measuring instruments and find out where it's at and you have to go through a certain pattern. But there is no, constraint on what happens in the world other than you were told, go, go do this mission and then we'll analyze later how well you did that mission. Right, is that a good answer to the question? All right, great. You're welcome. All right, so uh, talking a little bit about the technology. So here's a bunch of different inputs, right? So uh, key to virtual reality then is being physically engaged with the medium. And here's, uh, I don't know what, 14 different ways that you can interact with a virtual world. But if you look closely, you'll notice all these have to do with your hands and or your fingers, right? So there's other things, right? It's not always just about the hand for virtual reality. Uh, the one, the blue one in the upper left-ish area, those are, those are the, a video camera on some uh, your uh, pupils, right? So that's doing eye tracking, see which direction your pupils are looking. Uh, feet, we have the whole body. This suit that the gentleman on the right is wearing uh, is one of the, is keeps track of things like heart rate and respiration, things like that, right? We have audio input, we have cameras, we have foot pedals, uh, we have wind instruments in the upper right here. So lots more for virtual reality, maybe than just the, the standard user interfaces. I don't want to be a No, no, go ahead. Right, because most computers have cameras on them. So yes. Right, that's right. Right, she mentioned Dance Dance Revolution. So yes, that's true, that's true. There is uh, definitely an ex ex explosion of different input devices for other media as well. They don't have the sensors. Right, well, not too many people have the suit, which is actually yeah. analyzing, right? That's uh, usually for specific uh, things if you're doing meditation or you want to see their medical state or uh, you're doing like these phobia treatments, things like that. Right, so one of the things then for virtual reality we want to know is in order to accomplish this notion of physical immersion we started with is what's the position of the user. Uh, in some cases, the entire position of their body, what pose do they have. And so the picture on the right shows what uh, the Xbox Connect can do. It can find the people in the space and kind of give you a, a rudimentary skeleton of what they're doing. 
Uh, and the left is the tracker system that we have in this room here, the, the HTC Vive uh, Valve Lighthouse tracker system. So uh, the little box on the left is opened up and it has some spinning discs. Uh, in this room here, you'll see there's a pair of those hanging from the ceiling. Uh, likewise, up in Indianapolis, there'll be uh, some in the room next door. Uh, and then there's a hand controller, there's kind of a generic controller, and then also head-mounted displays have those same things. And I don't have a slide on it, so I'll just point it out here. And, and uh, this is where the camera would have been a good thing. Anyway, so we have a head-mounted display here, and it has those same dimples that are you can see on the controller. So those of you who are here with us, uh, the controller has these little dimples on it, and the head-mount display has those dimples as well. Those dimples are light sensors that the little black boxes have emit these uh, rotating beams, beacons of light. They're called lighthouses. They have a rotating beacon of light, and the little dimples then sense when that light passes, and they, they do uh, sort of navigational measurements based on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Question. Yeah. Um, I the other day I went to a meeting where I took the light and we have an lab and the people that asked me what that little camera is for at on the front of the light. Right. Um, now we've used it before when we use charge system, the type system. Yes. So that you have a camera when you're in the oven. What would you usually use that for? Right. So uh, Andreas was asking about the camera on the bottom of the the standard HTC Vive and the, the Vive Pros actually have a pair of cameras. Um, typically, what, um, uh, what they've been used for out of the box is safety of the user, right? So uh, if you've, if it, for those of you who've tried a Vive, if you want, that there's a bounds that you set of safe walking zone, and we'll see that here later this afternoon. Uh, and so when you get close to that bounds, this kind of barricade comes up, a, you know, a grid, a line of a colored grid. And once you see that, you say, okay, I'm, I'm close to the edge of the safe walking zone. You can also use that camera to augment that with a, uh, a filtered version of the real world. So you can actually see, oh, there's a chair there. Oh, there's a table. It's not just the bounds. It's actually what's there. So then if you want to set something down or you want to avoid, you still want to walk over there, but you know that there's a chair in this particular area. You can avoid that. I've looked to see if people have tried to use augmented reality with those where you can, uh, you know, Andreas knows what augmented reality is, but for the rest of you, um, you know, where you take the real world and you merge in the virtual world. And so you have uh, a little bit of each. Uh, and I have not seen anybody, well, specifically with the old vibes, nobody's done augmented reality. I asked an augmented reality researcher recently if he used the two camera versions of the Vive to do it. He found that those cameras aren't high enough quality to actually load in the real world, merge in the virtual world, and then display that back to them. Um, and you like them, and what I have seen are uh, <coughs> Z makes Yes, that's actually camera. what they use. They use the Z. Yeah, that you can, I think, mount. I've never done myself, mount on top of the device. Yes. And then attach it to the. Right. The, the, the. So, the, yes, Andres has mentioned the Z uh, stereo camera pair, and that's what the augmented reality research I talked to, he said they use that instead. Yep. All right. Okay. So, we talked about lots of different inputs. Again, physical immersion is what makes virtual reality uh, unique. Uh, and so, I want to talk about position tracking, which is what lets us do that. So I've listed eight different technologies for position tracking. I have pictures that represent each of those. <clears throat> Starting with in the upper left there, there's mechanical tracking. So that's a very old display. But uh, the nice thing about mechanical tracking is that it's instantaneous, right? It's just encoders and they can read and there's no calculations that have to be done other than you know 20 degrees, 20 degrees point one or whatever. And then a couple of matrix multiplies. And so you can instantaneously know where that is. Uh, the next one, electromagnetic, is represented by the two pictures in the upper right. So it has these coils, which the diagram shows, that go in three orthogonal di directions. It both has those coils in an emitter, which in the picture on the right, there's a box up at the top, a big black box, has a really big set of these coils. And then in the little nodules on the side of the glasses on, the, uh, on Lance there underneath, uh, that has another set of coils that are have electricity generated in them. So the big set of coils generates magnetism by putting electricity into them. The little set of coils uh, have electricity generated by being in the magnetic field and then by how much electricity is generated in each direction tells us uh, where and, and what direction that unit is in. <clears throat> so you don't need to know that. Not, 
there's uh, electromagnetic tracking has kind of come and gone. It used to be the standard in virtual reality, went away for a long time. Uh, the Razor Hydra hand, uh, hand inputs brought that back a little bit. And actually the Magic Leap uses those for their hand controller. So it's still, uh, it's still a viable technology today. Optical, we have actually two kinds of optical. One is with a, a slew of cameras, which the little red cameras represent. And there you just mount a bunch of cameras around the room. You have some markers that they're watching and then uh, they can see what's happening. The next one, video metric, is the kind of the opposite way where you have the camera itself is what's being tracked. <clears throat> and so the little mouse guy there is a augmented reality application. And the thing he's virtually standing on is a piece of paper that uh, the app knows where that knows what the shape of the diagrams are on the piece of paper. So when you move the camera around, it knows where it's at. And so the little mouse character follows around. And then the final picture in the lower right has a bunch of kind of uh, specialized markers that look like simple QR codes. And again, you, in this case, they would mount a camera on top of your head mounted display. Uh, and um, it would look out and see those QR codes and know, okay, if I see that one over there, that means uh, I'm in that direction. And if it's a certain size, it tells you how close you are to it. That's actually the, one of the rooms that Valve experimented in before they came up with the, uh, the lighthouse tracking. <clears throat> so that's one of the early consumer VR tests. Then on the bottom, we have ultrasonic. I just have a couple examples of that. So the ones in the upper right, basically it's similar to the, uh, uh, <clears throat> some of the camera ones where you basically have sounds are emitted from a certain location, a known location. And then on the receiving side, there's little microphones and they basically triangulate. How long did it take that sound to travel, right? We know how fast sound travels in air. How fast did it take to get from that speaker to this microphone, that speaker to this microphone, and you just triangulate and figure that out. Uh, there's inertial, which we use all the time now in our phones. So the phone display, you can have like a little simple AR using your phone. And we did one for uh, Enrico a couple years ago. Uh, the, you know, the Wiimote was kind of one of the first game controllers that put that uh, into use. And then neural is the one in the upper left there. So you see this guy has these two Mios on his arm. Uh, and he has a, a prosthetic device that he can then control based on uh, the muscle, the neural information going to the muscles that no longer exist uh, in his arm. Uh, and then in the lower left is what we call SLAM tracking, which stands for simultaneous location and mapping. And basically what that does, this is the modern, this is kind of the up and coming tracking system. Uh, has some cameras, uh, usually more than one camera, looks out at the world, figures out what it sees. It sees a chair over there. It sees this texture pattern on the carpet, right? It sees some uh, uh, images on the back wall. And it, so it maps what the world looks like. And then if, if it moves, it says, oh, the world moved you know, to the right for me. And all those pictures moved or they turned. Because then it knows that, well, probably the world didn't move. Probably the camera moved. And so it moves, it figures out where it is now in the world. Uh, and so the HoloLens was one of the first uh, consumer or pseudo consumer products that made use of SLAM tracking along with the Google Tango on the lower right there. And then there's a picture of a room with the kind of the uh, grid markings of how it's mapped out that space. So position tracking is kind of the key input side of virtual reality. Uh, then we have the output sides, the next step of the definition that we started with. And for virtual reality, there's kind of three major classifications of visual displays. Uh, same for sound, but we'll use visual because that's the most common. <coughs> Pardon me. So the first one is, and the way most people are going to be familiar with VR, is displays that are coupled to the head, right? So if you have your, your Vive here, it's got a couple of lenses inside that have a display in front of it. It's got a strap on the top that, that uh, secures it to your head. And so then you, when you look around, those displays are at the same position relative to your eyes as when you started. Uh, another one is the display that the user enters, which we see in the middle picture there. So this is what was first termed a cave. Uh, it's a trademark term though, so people came up with other different terms. Uh, generally, I refer to them as cave style displays. Uh, when they were first created, they of course needed projectors to do that. Now people use tiled displays uh, generally for that, although because tile displays have little borders in them, little mullions, it's, uh, it can uh, in slightly negatively impact the effect, but uh, the cost effectiveness uh, kind of balances that out. That it uh, uh, doesn't take up nearly as much space, which is part of the cost effectiveness. And then the other one is displays that the user holds, which 
is basically the augmented reality style thing that we showed with the, the phone display in the last picture. All right. Pardon me. So um, just a brief one slide history of, of the two major types of virtual reality. So the head mount displays came first and they came basically 50, now 51 years ago. Uh, they were invented by um, a postdoc or a professor at Harvard, Ivan Sutherland. Uh, he took it, he was hired at Utah and he took his uh, work to, with him to Utah. So he kind of completed the work there. Uh, and there's a picture of that in the uh, upper level on the left side, right? So that's an uh, old black and white picture. There's a tracking unit on the ceiling that uses sound. So he uses ultrasonic measuring. He also used mechanical. You'll see a beam on the right side. For those of you in the room here, this beam here uh, actually could track, the mechanically track where the user walked. So there were different, uh, different ways to do that. Um, and then kind of we went a couple of decades with sort of steady but slow progress. And so the picture in the upper right shows a really old style head mounted display, uh, very clunky and big screens and uh, not high resolution. Uh, then after a couple of decades, um, a student at a VR lab at the University of Southern California did a Kickstarter and created the uh, Oculus Rift sort of movement, right? So uh, his Kickstarter was funded, was you know, overly funded, and he uh, uh, took, it, took that funds and you know, actually produced what he promised with the Kickstarter. Uh, and so he just deployed these sets. So uh, the picture in the lower right here is Chauncey uh, wearing one of our uh, DK1s. Uh, we call it DK1, that's Development Kit 1, which came out a year after the Kickstarter. Uh, they had a second round of development kits, the DK2, and then uh, in 2016, they released their public version, the consumer version, and as it happened, uh, HTC and Valve had been working together and they released the Vive also in 2016, and Sony with their PlayStation also released the PlayStation VR in 2016. So 2016 was kind of the year that consumer VR uh, hit the market. Uh, here on campus, uh, we, we took advantage of that and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but this room was one of those reality labs that I mentioned here. Uh, and for those of you up at IUPUI, around the corner is one of our rooms. Or I don't know if we, I guess that's not true. We have a next lab up there. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, anyway, we have these notions of reality labs that we established uh, in various places, a couple of them here on campus, uh, including the room that I'm standing in, which is the picture on the left. Uh, and then uh, the picture in the middle is Chauncey showing uh, some of his uh, work to uh, Mark Cuban when he came to campus uh, a few years back now, right? Because sure. I think, yes. <laughs> I, don't think, uh, I don't think Mark was as hard on Chauncey as he is on the, some of the contestants at Shark Tank. He didn't give me any money. Yeah, no, well, that's true, <laughs> which I guess is the, uh, is the actual metric, right? <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> a little bit more long, a longer ver history of caves, but mostly because I have a, several uh, bullet points of when and where caves have been on, on our campus here and in Indianapolis. Uh, but the cave was invented in 1991, essentially. Uh, there were a couple of different groups that came up with the same notion at the same time. So Sun Microsystems had a group that came up with something similar. Uh, but the cave is the one that took off. It was invented by, at the University of Illinois in Chicago by Tom Defani and Dan Sandin. Uh, with help from a lot of graduate students. Uh, Carolina Cruz Niera is uh, one who went on to do a lot of more uh, big things in virtual reality when she got her PhD. Uh, they displayed it at uh, the computer graphics conference called SIGGRAPH, which happened to be in Chicago that, the next year uh, in 1992. And then it uh, slowly promulgated and then kind of started taking off in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, including the, the notion of having a six-sided cave. So a cave is projectors all around you, which of course, if you want to do six sides, that means, you know, in the past we had projected onto the floor from above, but if you're going to have a screen above you, you can't have a projector up there. Uh, so for a six-sided cave, you actually have to be standing on projected, like thick plexiglass uh, surface. And so it kind of is more of a mechanical engineering feat, but uh, uh, accomplish this accomplishment nonetheless. And so, Carolina Cruz was at Iowa State when they first made their six-sided cave in 2000. Uh, so then you'll see a lot of bullets where uh, caves were built and decommissioned on our campuses here uh, and then replaced with the next technology. So at the moment, 
Uh, at IUPUI, we have what we call the concave, which is the picture in the lower right. It might be split in two by now, but uh, that gives you one representation. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, and so that kind of replaces the projection style system. It's using the tile displays. You can see that there's borders, but they're uh, as unobtrusive as we can make them at the moment uh, and not too bad. And we're building something similar to that now in, uh, on, the, on the east side of campus here at IUB. Uh, and so that notion of using tile displays, uh, I don't know if I'd say invented, but was first demonstrated and deployed. There is a lot of technological stuff that has to happen, especially we use uh, what we call, getting a little off topic, but we use passive stereo with these displays, which makes it cheaper. But it also means that if a display is too high, then the stereo doesn't work. So you have to do a lot of engineering to figure all that out. Uh, which the folks at the University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, uh, with a vendor made that happen. So the rest of us kind of benefit from that. All right, so a little comparison, side-by-side -side comparison of the benefits of each uh, stationary systems and head-based displays. Uh, so the pictures are swapped with the bullets, but uh, the stationary, uh, oh no, they aren't, sorry. The stationary pros then is that you, the person has to wear less stuff, right? Now for head-mount displays, we're, we're probably a few years away, but at some point it'll be like putting on a pair of glasses. I've seen glasses that the field of view isn't very good, but uh, it, it, they have little displays in them. And so I think the head-based displays will, will kind of catch up in that regard. Uh, it's a little easier if you're just pairing, wearing what looks like a pair of sunglasses <clears throat> to talk to the other people in the room with you. So that's kind of a pro for uh, stationary displays, or in other words, caves. It works better for groups because you can, everybody can kind of see what's going on. Uh, and it's also uh, because of the way uh, the screen already has information when you turn your head, it, it makes it, it's a little less prone to simulator sickness than head-based displays. Uh, head-based displays, far less equipment. Uh, they take up a lot less space. You can put, pack them in a, in a backpack and travel around with them. They're now orders of magnitude less expensive. They used to be maybe one order of magnitude less expensive. Now they're two or three orders of magnitude less expensive. If you want to, exclu uh, if you want to get rid of the real world, you can include the real world. Uh, it has what we call 100% field of regard, which means no matter which direction you look, you see the computer generated world. Uh, that's only the case in six sided uh, cave style displays. Uh, so you have to do a lot more to, to get there. <clears throat> and of course they're a lot more portable. All right, so we put all that together, our displays, and uh, we can have a full virtual reality experience. So here's a computer graphics pioneer, uh, Jim Blinn, riding the Birdly experience a couple of years ago. And you can see there's a fan on there that gives him breeze. Uh, this isn't Chauncey's work, but Chauncey does some similar work. Here you could flap your arms as an input device. There's head tracking, and then there's a, we see the display of what he's seen on the monitor behind. <coughs> all right. So that's what VR is, that's how you make VR. Uh, why do you wanna do it, right? So I just have a few slides on this. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, VR here uh, at our various campuses, IU campuses. Uh, so again, why do virtual reality? Well, it's the physical immersion, right? Putting you in a place, that's the key. That's uh, what makes VR unique. That's so if we, if we want that, VR is the way to go. Uh, we can make it a human scale interface, so you can move your arms as far, far and wide as you can reach. You can shrink things down if you need to, so uh, it doesn't have to be that way, but you can walk around objects. Uh, and so it, it helps put you in the space because you can physically move to interact with the world. And it helps you get embodied in that world and gives you agency, which is another topic for another lecture. Uh, so uh, here's kind of a brief list of what things you can things you can do. Uh, many of these we'll cover this semester, right? So Chauncey will talk about simulation and training. Uh, I'll talk about scientific visualization in general. We'll have a few people come in and talk about specific visualization things. Uh, Jeff will talk about building design. Uh, Margaret will talk about artistic things in TASIS in the Cyber DH uh, series of lectures. And then one of our Mondays we'll talk about what I call here enhanced entertainment, i.e. games, right? Uh, so after I'm done, I'm going to start up Google Earth here. Uh, folks in Indy can do that if they like. Uh, but just to give people a taste of it, so you don't have to wait for Monday a week and a half from now to try it. So I will fire up Google Earth in a moment. Uh, it's a free app uh, for people. Who, if you have the Steam is the kind of one of the main uh, application uh, distribution uh, tools. 
Uh, it's, a, it's a game distribution tool, but people use it for other things as well. And so Google has put up this virtual reality version of their Earth program, and it lets you basically travel anywhere in the world. Now, some of the places are more enhanced than others. Uh, so if you see this picture of Manhattan here, and then in the lower part, a picture of Bloomington, uh, where they've flown airplanes across over the towns, and then the, from the airplane uh, imagery capture, they actually can make these 3D reconstructions. Now you'll see that this picture of uh, a Lindley Hall, the building roofs are a little, are pretty good, but not perfect, and the trees are, are way uh, wonky. Of course, they were moving around and stuff when the airplane was flying by, but it's really still pretty impressive. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll we'll show that one in a few minutes. All right, so a little bit more, revisit our lectures. So uh, on the left here is the lectures for this particular workshop series. And then I already talked about the VR expeditions that we'll do on Mondays. And so the schedule for that is on the first couple of slides, uh, starting with cultural heritage and the arts on January 28th. Thank you. Uh, and so, but VR is here, it was here available now and it's available here on, on campus here and on campus in India and some of our other campuses. Uh, and so, uh, oh yeah, here, every other Monday. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about VR at IU and then we'll wrap things up. <coughs> All right, so the lab was there when it was founded. He's now above the Advanced Visualization Lab. But anyway, so when it was created, it was created actually with VR in mind, right? I mean, it's one of the main, main things. And so the people who are now here doing VR as part of the advanced legislation group, I think we have maybe six people. Our whole life, of the, if you add up all our experience, uh, oh, I'm missing a letter, a word there. It's communal. We have a, cent a century of commu communal. Oh, there it says, it does say it. Uh, a century of cumulative experience. I said it. Uh, and so, of course, other places do too, but they have a century of commu cumulative experience by hiring 50 people with two years of experience. We have like six people with 15 or more years of experience. So. <laughs> Um, so here's a bunch of the labs that are available on our, our two campuses here. I have some more slides in a moment. This is just kind of a quick overview. Uh, and we interact with, it says clientele, we interact with people in physical sciences, arts and humanities, other people who use our, our high performance computing services. Um, so I have details. So here's uh, kind of our current model for how we interact with clientele. Uh, we used to, pretty much exclusively work what we call type three here, where you would come, you would bring your data and we would have to hand code with you some experience, some tool, some uh, application in order to work with your data. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, we kind of graduated, there were some tools in the scientific area like Paraview, where we could take an existing tool, take your data, that's type two, kind of moving up from the bottom here, your data, so you would have to learn how to uh, use that tool. Uh, you would also, we'd also have to get your data into that tool, which uh, depending on the, how the data was uh, acquired uh, could be more or less uh, cumbersome. Um, and now with uh, a lot more consumer-based uh, tools available, uh, we can offer more people, you know, a quicker way to jump into using different tools because the applications exist and there might even already be the data out there, like for Google Earth, the data's there, the tool for flying around the data is there. Uh, so we can get people up and running a lot more quickly that way. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of learning opportunities on our two campuses primarily. Uh, myself, uh, Professor Margaret Delinsky, Professor Michael Chabin, uh, teach classes here on campus uh, that some way involve uh, creating VR content uh, and or learning about VR. Uh, up in IUPY, uh, there's a couple of classes involved in creating uh, experiences with virtual reality. So Chauncey is one of those people uh, who does that. <clears throat> and then we have a lot of YouTube videos. These lectures are recorded. Uh, we do other group presentations. We do occasionally do some consulting, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, which is our, has been our, our, our main way of operating, but we want to expand uh, our reach a little bit. So we're doing more uh, group things. Uh, and then we have a lot of online resources uh, we like curate some of the software that's in this room. All right, so here's some reality labs, kind of where we call this room the real, one of the reality labs. Uh, it was kind of became about because of consumer priced VR, 
and the fact that you could download applications, right? That's one of the things that made it possible. Here's some of our early installations. I have a more complete list that Eric sent me in a moment. Uh, this is kind of what constitutes a reality lab, right? So we have a computer, uh, we have a space for tracking, and we have then uh, the people doing the, doing the work. The people have access. So the, the computers, in this case, these students, uh, which are in this room here, uh, they all they can just log into these machines and the VR is ready to go. They don't have to have any formal training. They can find training just for general VR on the information on the internet. So uh, it works uh, pretty, pretty well that way. Um, so here's kind of one of our goals, right, is we want to uh, get people using virtual reality. It's one of the goals for our reality labs. Uh, and we want to provide them with some applications that we know, we kind of trust, have vetted, uh, that'll work well for them. And then we're also working with people to do some content creation as well. And so most of the reality lab stations should have uh, kind of this little curated group of software uh, that we have. So here's, here's uh, some utility software that's installed on most of our reality lab, our reality system, our reality stations rather, uh, including Unity and Unreal, and then kind of modelers and things like that. Uh, and then on the right, it, as I mentioned, lots of Steam VR apps are pre-selected that uh, we've deemed, uh, you know, worth trying out. Uh, here's a, a dozen or so of those applications. You can see some of these are, this jaunt one is a narrative experience. There's others that are like little museums. There's some that are just little fun uh, carnival type things. Uh, there's the speech trainer. Oh, I, I meant to mention that's another kind of phobia, uh, overcoming a phobia type application. Uh, and then like a little historical narrative on Apollo 11, things like that. Hey, there's Eric. Uh, all right, so where are the reality labs? Uh, so we have 12 of them open with uh, several stations at each on presently three campuses. Uh, so we, this is one of the pilot ones, the room that we're in here now. So here's kind of a, a list of them and the campus that they're on. So the bottom one has is IU East. And at the moment, the other ones are here in Bloomington and up in Indianapolis. Uh, and so you can see several on these two campuses that you can visit. Uh, this room here uh, during the day is booked with classes, except on Fridays. So it's, can be, if you want to come in the daytime, it's harder to get into, say, this room. But that's where the Wells Library works pretty well. I don't see it on there. Is the Wells Library not considered? A, like it's not a reality lab. Oh, it's a uh, 3D print and modeling. Ah, yes, right, right, right. yes, right. So this is the Wells Library right here, the middle one at IUB with six, six stations. Very good. All right, and we also, in addition to our, you know, consumer level stations, reality stations, we also have what the, uh, we refer to as these flagship facilities, uh, which the one image here, which is a 3D represent, 3D generated uh, image of our lab in Indianapolis called the Next Lab. Uh, so you can see that it has the concave in the uh, upper corner as it is here. In the upper upper left corner, upper right corner is kind of our, our reality stage. Uh, and then on the bottom-ish side is our reality stations, our mobile carts. So you can wheel those out, uh, use them, and then put them back against the wall. Um, so the, the, we'll speak about it in a moment, but the, uh, the wall, the tile wall in the back is reconfigurable. And we'll have more or less those same equipment, except maybe the reality stage, I guess, down here in Bloomington as well. Uh, there's the stage. Uh, and so that has things in addition to vision and sight, um, vision and sound. Uh, Chauncey has it set up with a heat lamp in this case and some fans to generate temperature uh, differentials. And there's other things you can do as well. So this is a, a project of Chauncey's that uh, I'm sure he'll talk about uh, next week. Maybe. Uh, here's our, the concave and our close-up view. Uh, and so again, we'll have a similar facility as being developed right now down here in Bloomington. And, and this is reconfigurable. So on the left, uh, we've got three other options for how you can do it with just four columns. Uh, so we can split our, our wall into two groups of four instead of one big uh, eight column system. Uh, and that way you can have kind of more flexibility for how you want to use it. So for different art installations, you might choose this kind of jagged one. Uh, and for supercomputing, the one in the upper right, we use that kind of as a column. Like what do we call that? Do we have a name for it? The column? Okay. Pillar. Yes, the pillar. Those look very like transportable though. Just like 
transformer. Right, so each of these is on like a sled. So we can slide those around. It's not super transportable, but we did take them to Dallas just two months ago. So uh, at least we took four of them with the one in the upper right here. Uh, so I would, so it's not like you're gonna do it on a weekly basis, but uh, you know, every few months, it's certainly possible to reconfigure the room. And if you need to take it for a, a road show of high importance, we can do that. Comment? Oh, yes. Specifically for people who wanted to do creative sort of things, for most applications, something that's you know flat is probably going to have the most general usage. But uh, uh, we work with artists and, and, and architects, as, as Bill has mentioned, so they might need or want something that's different. So we have that flexibility. Yeah. Right. This is an indie. We are, uh, one of our team members is, you know, like as we speak almost building the one in, in Bloomington here. So it's on its way. Uh, again, here's another picture. Oh, here's the wall, the column rather in, uh, in operation in the lower right, uh, being, getting ready to go. All right. So, uh, if you want to work with us, you know, we're here, right? So you can talk to ABL staff, uh, to work it out. You can also just visit this room if you have an IU account. You can just visit this room or the Wells Library and, and log in or in Indianapolis, uh, one of our labs there. Uh, you know, we can get you started briefly or we can talk longer. Oh, and one last thing. There's, you know, I have a book on virtual reality that just came out. So if you want to flip through this, uh, this is actually the second edition of a book. It was First edition came out in 2002, so quite a bit changed between the two editions, including the addition of about 50% of page count. So that's it, any other questions? Any questions from Indianapolis? Well, they may have to tell you because I can't hear over here, I don't think so. Eric's, Eric will un, maybe turn up his volume if you have questions in Indianapolis. No questions in Indianapolis, thank you. I heard some voice, but I didn't know if it was mine echoing or someone speaking. No, no questions from Indianapolis. No questions? Is that what we said, Chauncey? That's correct. Thank you. Ah, there we go. Now I can hear you. Excellent. Okay. Very good. So in that case, uh, we'll wrap things up and I'll start up Google Earth for people who want to try it down here. And I don't know, it's already after five, so I don't know if Chauncey has time to do this likewise in Indianapolis, but... Uh, People can choose whether they right. stay or need to go. Yes. By the way, is it, uh, does everyone here have an IU account? Well, Joe doesn't, I don't think. Oh, I think I'll do that. Okay. Oh, awesome. All right, so I will stop the recording now. Thanks to everybody for participating.